Original video animation, never aired on TV, but released via DVD, Blu-ray, and of course, VHS. Now, last time I tried to keep things old and obscure, but this go around, I'm still gonna talk about a lot of old and obscure OVA, but I'll throw in a couple popular ones just to show that I hear you. Here's 10 more OVA to add to your watch list, and once again, don't worry about the order. Releasing in 1987, Twilight Q was an experimental series that would showcase the work of young, up-and-coming directors. Each episode would have an entirely different studio and staff attached to tell unique, one-off stories. Unfortunately, though, the project got canned after only two episodes. The first being A Knot in Time, which follows a couple high school students on summer vacay. One of the girls, Mayumi, goes on a dive and finds something that shouldn't be possible. A camera with a picture of her next to some person and she's never met. And the camera? Well, it turns out that hasn't even been made yet either. Intrigued by the impossible, Mayumi gets obsessed with solving this mystery. Animation-wise, it looks solid, but the characters and story are admittedly a tad basic. Things start out calm enough, but it doesn't take long for the atmosphere to become pretty suspenseful and creepy. More and more strange things keep happening to Mayumi and the town she's in. It's not all that scary, but it does put you off in a good way. The second episode, File 538, is a good litmus test for the pretentious. By that I mean it's one of those ego-driven art house projects, a neglected genre in the modern anime landscape. Now to be clear, I like this one, but I can absolutely understand why most people probably won't. First of all, you got airplanes turning into giant fish, that's gonna lose a couple people. And what follows is basically 30-ish minutes of still frames, background shots, and philosophic monologues by the freelance detective who's trying to explain the insanity of what's going on. It's easy to get lost in all the backdrops and the schizo rants. When things get moving, they look great, but it's mostly pretty static. Even so, the style of the episode keeps things interesting. Now, sure, I wanted to hear an explanation for what was going on, but really, I just wanted to see which striking visual would show up next. Tomomi Mochizuki directed episode one and Mamoru Oshii episode two. Now, I haven't seen much of Mochizuki's stuff, but I recognize a couple titles here and there. Oshii, on the other hand, now that's a name I know, and I'm sure you do too, even if you don't realize it. If you've seen his other stuff, you got an idea of what to expect. Now he's gonna come up again in a minute, but before we talk about that OVA, we're gonna talk about another anthology from 1987. Robot Carnival is an anthology of eight short stories that involve robots. Actually, I guess it's technically nine if you include the part where a bunch of poor saps lose their homes to the title crawl. Now, each story is directed by some animation heavyweights, and that definitely comes across in the final product. Each section has its own style, but I'd say all of them are very fun to look at. Some of the stories are voice acted, but most of them are silent besides sound effects and the musical score. Like I said, each story involves robots, but not every story is all that much about robots. A couple of them barely focus on the robot part at all, it just happens to include them as part of the scene. One story might go all in and tackle the kinds of things you'd expect from a robot-centric story, like exploring the morality of it all or what it means to be alive, but others go for a more, I don't know, Fantasia feel? We even get another art house project. This one, not the biggest fan of to be honest, but it was something. There's also a story that's a mecha battle with a very interesting depiction of the old US of A. I pray that your souls may rest with God. Now it is time! Oh, what did you say? I was born in the world, but I was born in the world. I'm not gonna stand here and listen to you badmouth the greatest democracy the world has ever known. Okay, three, two, one, it's jam. But I think my favorite part was probably Nightmare, which looks exactly like the name suggests. A robotic harbinger of destruction awakens a bunch of robots that start terrorizing the city with the main dude just trying to survive. 
It's basically like the finale of Michael Bay's first Transformers movie, but without Linkin Park, so slightly less Kino. This one's definitely for the animation junkies. I mean, it looks fantastic. And the variety in these shorts means there's gonna be at least one section that you really like too. I could spend more time singing this thing's praises, but there's only so many creative ways I can say it's a well-made OVA. A post-apocalyptic, dystopian, science fantasy anime. That's a lot of buzzwords. Genesis Survivor Giarath. Giarath? Giarath? Genesis Survivor is a three-part OVA about a young man going on an adventure to avenge his robot father figure. Along for the ride is a badass robot, an asshole merc, and, uh, she does put on pants, eventually. I love the mismatched world of Genesis Survivor. It's like a sword and sandal story, but with robots and magic based on science. It's pretty interesting to see how certain fantasy aspects fit into the world too. For example, elves aren't the usual frolicking forest types or even servants of the Antichrist like in the Elder Scrolls series. Instead, they're synthetic humans. That's a new one. As for the main players, Ital is your standard naive strong arm. Zaxxon looks cool and has a mysterious past. Zahari is a pretty cute girl boss. And the last member, who doesn't really become a member until the third and final episode, has a name that sounds like an Aussie saying one of the no-no words, but uh, he's pretty chill too. The action goes pretty hard and the soundtrack has a nice ring to it. Just one little problem, and that's that there's a lot of cool ideas that get brought up, but ultimately left unexplored. My biggest complaint is probably that the ending feels a little abrupt. Like, maybe we should have gotten an extra episode to build up the finale some more. As it stands, Genesis Survivor is a neat little story with a cool aesthetic and some fun characters. <laughs> The evil and mysterious Telegraph Pole Society wants to take over the world, and it's up to the local high school defense force to stop them. Now, the force is made up of a couple of jocks, an irrelevant girl, and an Indian guy who got in a car accident and was accidentally turned into a cyborg warrior, all because the doctor's hand slipped. <laughs> What the Prefectural Earth Defense Force is a big old parody of uh, whatever genre Power Rangers belongs to. For a gag OVA, it looks pretty good. The action scenes are fluid and frequent. There's tons of jokes thrown around too. Some of them didn't really land, but most of them got a fierce nasal exhale out of me. The characters are cheesy, the bad guys are goofy, and the plot, kinda unimportant. It's just a silly Saturday morning cartoon kind of deal where the stakes sound high but really aren't, and the heroes and villains hang out with each other when they aren't causing an inconvenience for Joe Sixpack and the rest of the population. It's a shame it's just the one episode, but it might have gotten stale if it went on any longer. You can tell the animators had fun with this one, and I'm sure it's filled with a bunch of references that went right over my head, too. It's definitely a product of its time, and that's fine by me. Alright, here's one I'm betting you didn't know about. Download is a story about a perverted Buddhist monk who hooks up with a stripper and some delinquents to stop a corporate bat cat from killing the terminally online with a computer virus called Death Mail. This one's a little light on plot and somewhat heavy on plot. Now, despite being a 90s anime, it's very fluid with the animation. The characters are constantly pouring themselves all over the place. It's a style that's not for everyone, but I think it suits the strange situations and frantic action scenes found in the anime. Madhouse really lived up to their namesake with this one. 
仕事サボってフラフラ遊びに出るからバチが当たったのよ !I did not expect a country western soundtrack for a cyberpunk anime, but、uh, that's what download went with. And it's not half bad. It's very different from not just 90s anime generally, but cyberpunk anime in particular. Now you can find plenty of what are essentially westerns with robots, but very few will be as lighthearted as download. I mean, the anime is not all sunshine and rainbows either. The OVA kicks off with some poor sap logging onto the internet and getting bombarded with k o n propaganda and porn. <laughs> Yeah, they really nailed the internet, didn't they? Oh,、uh, yeah, and he dies or whatever. But still, it's not Serial Lane or Armitage. I guess it's pretty close to Dominion Tank Police. I don't know. The point being, it doesn't challenge your perception of technology or anything like that. It's just a short, goofy adventure that doesn't take itself too seriously. Yeah. Okay, cool. War has changed. It's no longer about nations, ideologies, or ethnicity. It's an endless series of petty games played by politicians and religious heads in reachy mahjong tournaments. War and its consumption of. <coughs> <coughs> you, you get the idea. What the hell is this? Why are you talking about some trash from 2010? Isn't this video supposed to be about retro a n I lied. The Legend of Kozumi. What an experience. Basically, a bunch of world leaders settle disputes or attempt world domination by playing Asian dominoes. If that sounds stupid, it's because it is. The OVA is just a glorified ad for the manga, and it almost got me. Now, the first episode starts off with a showdown between the Japanese and North Korea on an American aircraft carrier with George Bush, senior and junior.、Ah! No Jeb, though, so I'm forced to rate this OVA a solid 1 out of 10. Please clap.、Uh, there's not much I really need to say about this one. If you don't find the premise entertaining, then I don't know what to tell you. I will say, some of the depictions for these real life political figures might go a bit too far for some people. If you get offended easily, probably don't watch it. George Bush doesn't care about black people. I'm just bummed out that the Vicar of Christ only showed up to sequel bait. Now, apparently, the God Emperor himself shows up in the manga at some point. I don't think I'm ready to see that. Anyways, just check out the OVA. It's like 20 minutes of pure tism. Call it a palate cleanser. What the fuck are you, man? Last go around, we talked about some edgy 80s schlock, so how about some edgy 90s schlock instead? Genocyber is an infamously gory OVA from 1994 that, according to IMDb, had a little mix up with the age rating. Oh dear. Huh? <laughs> is it over? Dude, that was so cheesy. Uh, I won't lie to you, this one's pretty brutal, but if Megazone 2 3 and Battle Royale High School didn't upset your stomach, eh, you'll be fine. <laughs> the first episode is easily the most graphic, with characters' insides constantly not being inside of them. Not to mention the use of live action for certain sequences.、Uh, there's only so much I can show because I do enjoy making five bucks off my videos, so just take my word for it. It's gross. Oh, and if you don't like bugs, then. <laughs> Oops. Snap the fuck out of the head, so I don't see no bugs. I didn't mean to see that. All right, quick summary for the plot George Soros is trying to fund a super weapon to take over the world, and surprise, surprise, it doesn't end well. Some stupid science stuff happens, and a bunch of people die. Oh, and、uh, somewhere underneath all the carnage is a message that warns against the exponential growth of technology in our daily lives or something. Look, you're just watching this for the violence. Which looks pretty good for the most part. By the way, the English dub is pretty solid. 
I mean, it's not good, but it's one of those dubs filled with rampant profanity and cheesy line deliveries. That stuff is right up my alley, if pulled off correctly. Fucking asswipe! Hey, why don't you go get some pussy, huh? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm about to do. The only problem I really have is that the other episodes just aren't as good as the first. The last two really dragged this OVA down, especially because another company handled the dub, and it just became generically bad. It's still kind of fun, though. Okay, now if you please, won't you show us? Exactly right. Uh, that was a man, right? Besides the dubbing, it just isn't as graphically shocking as episode one, and that's like the whole shtick. I, I mean, I think there's a reason that first episode is about 50 minutes, and the other four are between 20 and just shy of 30. I'd say just watch episodes one, two, and three to finish out that part of the story, but maybe check out after that unless you're real curious about the ending, that's not much of an ending. I'm gonna enjoy sending you to hell. Now, I know I just said that the last two episodes of Genocyber were pretty mid, in part because of a bad dub, but sometimes a dub gets so bad that it turns into something amazing. Garzi's Wing is the absolute worst professionally produced English dub I have ever witnessed, and I wouldn't change a single thing. Get Bow and arrow? Huh? It's okay Take to this. kill them! Kill them all! Whoa. What happened to the war beasts? <laughs> The OVA follows Christopher Chiaki, who is the key to understanding everything. Therefore, to make sure you fully grasp his grandeur, we're just gonna consult his character bio on my anime list. You are so easy going. You get all that? Chris is a bit too school for cool and longs for some kind of adventure to take him away from the concrete jungles of the modern world. And one day, he gets his wish, or at least half of him does. His spirit is kidnapped into another world where an enslaved tribe believes him to be their holy warrior. Unfortunately for them, they got the wrong Chris. Now on the surface, this story is kind of interesting. I don't know another isekai where the main character gets split in two and can still communicate with himself between the two worlds, but there's no time to think about that because Garzi's wing never takes a break in the action. The first 20 minutes felt like a fever dream that I still don't understand. It doesn't help that I can't focus on figuring out what's going on because once people start talking, I just, <laughs> I, I can't do it, man. Whoa, whoa, don't go this way. Have the foot soldiers take another road. What is that? You dirty beast! Oh, Miss Hassan! I won't let you go, Hassan! Ah! Taurod is interesting because he is a loner. Everybody ready? Chris, here are the arrows with Gata. Thanks. Be careful. I intentionally fell off to protect the horse's feeling. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't do it. I can't. This shit no more, man. I mean, even if you didn't watch the dub, which I, I don't know why you would pass it up since it's the greatest comedy I've ever seen, Eat Your Heart Out Konosuba, this show still makes no sense. It's poorly paced, the characters are stale, the music is forgettable, and the action, actually, not half bad. But eh, who cares? This thing sucks. So it is true. Hassan's prayers have summoned the real Garzi's Wing Holy Warrior. I am defeated. That woman! What idiot was in charge of this circus anyway? Yoshiyuka Tomino? Why does he look familiar? Oh. Another entry from Oshi. Angel Egg came out just a couple years before Twilight Q. Now, once again, we're treated to beautiful background work in a dark, ominous looking world. But instead of a long internal monologue, there's hardly any talking at all. Maybe like 10 lines of dialogue for the entire 70 minute runtime? This is the deal maker and breaker. Angel Egg is slow, silent, and stuffed with symbolism. It's about a girl with a mysterious egg and a guy with a makeshift cross wandering around a ruined world filled with shadows and statues. The quiet atmosphere is occasionally interrupted with philosophical musings and goosebump inducing music. It kicks in when strange stuff starts happening. It 
it's hard to describe what Angel Egg is about because even though she doesn't know, we have to find the meaning in the madness ourselves and not everybody wants to do that, which is probably why this OVA got its cult classic status. Now Japan has this habit of throwing a bunch of Christian symbolism into their stuff for no reason other than it goes hard, it's fair enough, but Oshi at least knows his stuff given his background and it leads me to believe you can connect the dots and uncover some kind of message. I've seen people claim it's a story about questioning faith and others say it's a biography of Oshi's early life, which kind of includes the same. Honestly, I'm not sure what my interpretation even is right now. I definitely agree it's a story about faith, but is it condemning or condoning cynicism? <sighs> That's a tough one. I guess that's my take on what Angel Egg is about. It's designed to be a test for the viewer. Do you trust your own beliefs or will you fold the second someone pushes back on them? I think this is why so many people love this OVA. It's not heavy handed, but not vague either. You can decide for yourself which of these two characters has the right outlook. I guess I'm saying if you like reading into things and crafting theories and you haven't seen Angel Egg yet, then what are you waiting for? A cutie pie tomboy GF and her beast girl tarred wife traveling companion are just a couple of girls trying to make a quick buck by doing a little dungeon diving. Unfortunately, they have terrible luck, so they hardly ever turn a profit. It's on one of these outings that the ditzy duo uncovers one of the mythical treasures that make up the ultimate power. As you can imagine, they aren't the only ones after such a prize. Think of this anime like a fantasy JRPG because it's basically what it is. Now, I've never played Dragon Quest, unless we're counting Rocket Slime, but I do see a lot of people saying this anime feels a lot like that series, so do with that information what you will. The animation is great. Weighty fights and expressive reactions galore. I'd expect nothing less from the director of Gunsmith Cats. The characters are wonderful too. Irie is a strong, capable warrior with a short temper and a pesky curse that activates whenever she does magic. Also tomboy, very cool. Fam, on the other hand, is the support healer and resident fam service character. Oh, I see what they did there. The dynamic between these two characters is baked into their very designs. Now that's what I call visual storytelling. Telling. <laughs> Jokes aside, Fam's great. She's a pure, innocent soul that lights up any dark dungeon she's in. She may be stupid. The other characters are great too, and they get a decent amount of screen time to boot. They aren't super complex, and a couple of tire tropes make their way into the show, but the adventure was really fun, and I was left just wanting more. Hmm? <laughs> it's only four episodes, which sucks because the world seemed pretty interesting with its pseudo post-apocalyptic feel. And the guys just played off each other so well too. Now I know old equals good, new equals bad, but hear me out. Maybe we bring this one back? It probably wouldn't work. Ah. There's still a lot more OVA out there, and a big thank you to everyone who commented some titles last time. I I'm not ignoring them, just spacing them out a bit, and uh, plus a couple might get their own videos. On that note, go ahead and comment some more OVAs you want to see me cover, if you're so inclined. And until next time, Ave Maria, Deus Volt, and I'm thinking we call this series OVA Odyssey.